The best way to retire when you're still young isn't by maxing out your 401k. I'll show you. Retirement used to be known as a three-legged stool, where one leg was your pension you got from your company, a second leg was the social security you got from the government, and the third leg was your own personal savings or your investments. Well, now what we're seeing happen is that pensions have become a thing of the past because companies don't offer pensions anymore. Social security is drying up because the money that you're putting into social security, especially if you're under the age of 45, isn't going to fund your retirement, is going to fund fund somebody else to retire and then you have your own personal retirement savings and investments except the average person has nowhere near the amount of money that they need in order to be able to retire comfortably. This is where I want to start by defining what retirement is because I hate the traditional concept of retirement because for the average person retirement means that you work until you're 65 years old and then hopefully by the time you're 65 you'll have enough money put aside in your retirement account so you can quit the job that you may or may not hate and then with your 401k or other retirement accounts, you can use that plus social security to be able to finally start living your golden years and start enjoying your life. But what ends up happening to so many people who do this type of traditional retirement is you work so long at a job that you may or may not hate and then you quit and retire when you're 65 and then you have nothing to do. That's why they say those who retire early die early because if your idea of retirement is just sitting on your butt watching TV all day, you are going to go miserable. And why would you want to spend your whole life working and doing something that you don't like? This is why I hate the traditional idea of retirement, which is why I want to reframe that idea and have it be more of financial freedom. That's what true retirement is, especially to me where now you have enough money put aside or cash flowing from your investments where now you don't have to worry about money and you can do whatever it is that you want. And now you don't have to do things for money. You can do a job that you like, not for the money. You can do more things that you enjoy, like travel or giving or whatever else that you is because you don't have to do it for the money and you have built that financial freedom. And that is the retirement or the financial freedom or whatever you want to call it that I want you to work for. But the question is, how do you achieve that sooner rather than later? There are two ways that you can achieve this type of financial freedom. One is through your own savings and second is through your cash flow. And let me diagram this on my whiteboard. Saving your way to financial freedom is more of the traditional way to build this sort Sort of wealth and the way that most people do this is by following the four percent rule which says that now you want to build up enough wealth or enough savings where now you can pull out four percent of your wealth and then you can live off of this four percent so if you want to live off of say forty thousand dollars a year then this forty thousand dollars a year needs to be four percent of how much wealth you put aside and build which means you have to put aside one million dollars i messed that up over there but you need to put aside one million dollars that way you can start putting aside four percent and this is supposed to be adjusted for inflation because then you're going to pull out forty thousand dollars you have nine hundred and sixty thousand dollars left and then hopefully this money will continue growing with some sort of interest and that should hopefully meet inflation that way you can continue to pull out forty thousand dollars year after year after year now the problem with this is it doesn't work so well when you have high inflationary times because the inflation is going to eat away at this number and it doesn't work so well when you retire when you're young because this four percent rule was based off of people retiring when they're in the mid 60s because then you keep pulling the money out that way by the time you actually die you don't really have much money left so if you end up hitting this retirement number early when you're in your 30s or in your 40s or in your 50s well it doesn't do so much good because you might run out of money while you're still alive that's why i'm not a huge fan of this savings and the four percent rule instead i personally like this cash flow game where now if you can create enough cash flow from your investments then you can live freely because your cash flow, if you do it right, can also grow with inflation to continue funding your lifestyle. Now, I would say that a very accessible amount of cash flow that you can generate is going to be a 3 to 8% return. This isn't anything crazy. This is a very accessible number. You can get more, you can also get less, but this is a very, I would say, conservative range of what type of cash flow you can expect from your investments. That means if you were to invest $100, it is very accessible for you to get somewhere between 3 to 8% in cash flow from that investment. That means if you invest $100, that's $3 in cash flow to $8 in cash flow. 
Now the game is a little bit different because if you start with the same question or answer that you need $40,000 of income a year to be able to fund your life, the question is how much money do you need to put aside based off of this cash flow to achieve this much wealth? How do you do that? Well, you take $40,000 and then you're going to divide it by 3%, aka 0 0.03, and you're also going to divide it by 8%, aka 0 0.08, and then that's going to give you your investment amount. I couldn't do that calculation in my head, so I went and calculated it and I got a new marker, but what this told me is that if I can get an 8% return, I'm a money in cash flow. That means I need to put aside $500,000 that are generating me 8% in cash flow for me to earn $40,000 a year. And if I'm only earning 3% a year in cash flow, that means I'm going to need a $1.33 million investment fund. That way I can generate this $40,000 in cash flow. Now, the nice thing about this cash flow and the reason why I really like this cash flow is because, well, you don't have to sell anything to get paid. You continue to own that investment fund, you continue to own the asset, and the asset is just throwing off money. And this money is coming into your pocket, that way you can spend it. But the question is, where do you invest this money and why are you getting these different types of returns? The two most accessible ways for you to get this type of cash flow is by number one, investing your money into the stock market that pays off dividends, which is cash flow. Number two, investing your money into physical real estate, which takes more work. And if you wanted to go even more involved, then you can start a business. And if you can grow a business that no longer requires you, that's generating a profit, you can hire somebody else to run the company and then you get the profits as your cash flow. But I'm not gonna focus on the business side because that's a little bit out of the realm of this video. So let me focus on stocks and real estate and starting with the stock market. Yes, there are stocks that pay over an 8% dividend yield. You can just go to Google and search for companies with an 8% dividend or higher. Now what I wanna caution you here is that you don't wanna buy a stock based solely on its dividend. A dividend is when a company pays you, usually quarterly, meaning every three months, just for owning the stock. And this dividend means that a company is making a big enough profit that they have no other use for this money because a company can use this money to either save it for emergencies, they can use this money to reinvest, to open more stores, to invest in more research and development, to do other things like advertising and marketing, or they can give this money away to shareholders. One way that they can give it to shareholders is a dividend. So when a company is paying out a dividend, that generally means that they have a healthy profit that they can just give away to their investors and their owners. Now for you, that's a good thing because now you can get paid without having to sell your stock. But that dividend amount can also be deceiving, which is why you do not, repeat, you do not want to buy any stock based solely on its dividend. And I gotta give you that little disclaimer right now because investing has risks. You are never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point, which is why you need to always do your own due diligence and never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. And also all the stocks and ETFs that I'm about to talk about are just for example purposes, I'm not telling you what to buy. Now there's a couple ways for you to go out and play this. Number one is you can go out and invest in individual companies. Like if you were to go out and invest in say, the McDonald's company, which right now is paying around a 2% dividend yield, now you're putting your faith into the McDonald's company, into the McDonald's CEO, and into the McDonald's franchise. And then the idea is every month, every two weeks, you're gonna continue putting more money into this investment, that way you can generate this cash flow. Now when you don't need the cash flow, when you don't need the return on your money, you can just keep reinvesting this money, that way you can buy more stock and buy more shares and accumulate more cash flow because now you're using your money to buy cash flow. You're going to work every single day to buy this cash flow and then you use the cash flow to buy you more cash flow producing assets. It's like using your money to buy a money printing machine and then when your money printing machine makes you more money, you use this money that your money printing machine made and you use it to buy more money printing machines. But the risk here is what happens if McDonald's starts printing and creating some really bad burgers. And then people start getting more sick. And then there's bigger lawsuits against McDonald's. And then McDonald's goes bankrupt. Well now, not only is your cash flow gone, but all the money that you invested into the company, that's also gone. Because now you invested in a company that went bankrupt, that when your investment goes bankrupt, well that means it goes down to zero. And this is where you have to understand, when you invest in individual companies for the dividend, you're taking on all the risk, and now you have to be involved with that investment. I don't mean you have to go and start flipping burgers, but that means you have to now start keeping up with the company. You should be listening to the earnings calls. You should be looking at the financial statements. You should be looking at who's managing the company, and you have to see how good of an investment it is. If you're willing to do that, fine. 
but understand that it takes more work, more risk, and you also have more potential upside. The alternative is instead of you going out and investing in individual companies, you can invest in ETFs that give you exposure to a group of companies, and there are funds out there that give you exposure to high dividend paying stocks. So there are ETFs out there with the purpose of investing in dividend paying companies. That way you can maximize the returns that you have while also minimizing the risk. For example, this article from US News goes over seven different high dividend paying ETFs from SCHD to IDV to VYM to VIG to NOBL to WDIV to SDIV. So I listed those seven ETFs here with the dividends that the these ETFs are offering at the time of me recording this video. And as a quick disclaimer, I personally own shares of SCHD and VYM. If you want to read the article for yourself, I also linked it for you down in the description. But I broke down those seven ETFs here and I also put down how much dividend each one of these ETFs are paying at the time of me recording this video. By the way, I also own shares of SCHD and VYM. That's why they have a little star. This is not to tell you what to invest in, but let's talk about this because now you can see that some of these pay as low as 2.2. 3% and some of them pay as high as 14%. And this is where I want you to understand that every single ETF is going to have different goals and different types of things they're going to want to invest in. And generally, the general rule of thumb is the riskier in the investment, the higher the yield. So you can see that this has a 14% dividend. And what you'll also see is that with the higher dividend also comes with more volatility. And this is where you have to balance the right type of investment for you. Are you looking for more steady growth with a steady dividend? Or are you looking for more intense potential growth and more intense potential dividends, but with more potential volatility? And this is where you have to find the risk and reward balance for you. The way that you win as a dividend investor, where you can build real cash flow, where you can build real wealth that you can live off of and not have to worry about your money, is not by finding one of these ETFs or a stock to throw your money in and then just throw some money in today and then hold hopefully have enough cash flow to live the rest of your life. It's by building a consistent investment where now every week, every two weeks or every month, you're passively, automatically, continually investing your money into this investment that keeps paying you with cash flow. And let me show you the power of that. See, the reason why so many people get discouraged with this type of cash flow investing is because they look at the numbers today and they think, oh my God, I have to invest hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions of dollars for me to actually see the returns that I want. When you don't factor in the fact that your dividends will also hopefully be growing because if you're investing in a good company or good ETFs, well, not only will the stock value and investment value grow, but the dividends will also be growing as well because if a company is seeing growing profits, they can also pay out bigger dividends. So if you see a company today or a fund today that's paying out $100 a share with a $2 annual dividend, that's a 2% annual return on your money. But let's assume that a number of years go by and then if you invest in here, you see the stock price grow to $500 a share. And the dividend amount, let's just assume that it stays with the same ratio where now the dividend also 5Xs to $10 a share. Now you're still getting a 2% dividend, but the shares that you bought here when it was $100 a share are now paying you $10 of dividends per share that you own. So if you bought 10 shares, here, it cost you $1,000, and this $1,000 investment was only paying you $2 in dividends per share that you bought. You bought 10 shares, so you were getting $20 a year in cash flow. Well, that $1,000 investment now grew to $5,000, but here's where the cash flow gets fun, because you own 10 shares here. Now, each of these 10 shares are going to be paying you $10 in dividends each and every year, which means now you're getting not your $20, but you're getting $50 in cash flow and dividends. Now you can start to see where if you invested more than $1,000, if you continually kept buying more shares, not only are you seeing the value of your investment grow, but the value of your dividends grow as well. And that's where the real wealth is because sure, it's a 2% dividend, but this dividend now is a 10% return for you because you were buying them at $100 a share, not a $500 a share. And this is where that long-term investing becomes so important because if you're talking about investing for a decade or two decades, that gives you time for your investment to grow and also for your dividends to grow. That way you can compound your wealth, but it requires you to get started, even if it's only $100 and continually, passively, and automatically keep investing your money. Now I have a free ebook on how to start investing your money for cash flow. It goes over how to invest your money with things like dividends and stocks. It goes over how to go into investing into ETFs. It goes over how 
to invest in real estate for cash flow. It's a completely free ebook that we have through Market Insiders. So if you haven't read this ebook yet, I'll link it for you down in the description below. But this is where now I want to talk about real estate investing. The way that real estate investing works, we're all on the same page, is you go out and you buy a physical piece of real estate, whether it's a home, an apartment complex, an office building, a retail plaza, whatever it might be, and then you're going to rent it out to somebody else, whether it's somebody who wants to live in your property, whether it's a restaurant that wants to operate in your property, or whether it's a business that wants their office in your property, and in exchange for them using your building, they're going to pay you rent. Now for me, when I invest in real estate, I look for cash flow. Those are the type of deals that I want. And for me, I look for a 7% cash on cash return on my money. Meaning if I go out and invest $100 into a property, I want $7 worth of cash flow in my pocket after paying for all of my expenses. If I go out and I put in $100,000 of my own cash, that means I want $7,000 a year of cash flow after paying my expenses. Now, is this a good return or bad return? depends on where you live and it depends on where you're investing. If you're investing in the coast, if you're investing in San Francisco, Los Angeles, or Manhattan, you are going to have a very tough time trying to find a 7% cash on cash return on your properties because property values are so high and the rents are not high enough to justify a 7% cash on cash return on your money. You might be seeing a 1, 2, 3, maybe a 4% return on your cash. If you're investing in other places like the Midwest, now you can see 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, even 12% returns on your cash depending on what types of properties you're going to buy. Now again, is all cash flow the same? No. More risk, more potential return. Generally, when you're taking on higher returns, you also take on higher risk. Is that always the case? No, but that's the general rule of thumb. That's why you can find properties that will pay you 10 to 15% cash on cash returns, but those are generally going to be areas where there's higher crime, more vacancies, more turnover, and more damage to properties. So yeah, you can get much higher returns, but it's going to require more maintenance and more work on your end. Are you willing to take that on? And that's going to depend on you. If you don't want to take that on, well, then you got to find the right happy medium for you where how involved do you want to be with your investments, where you can get the cash flow that you want, but it also doesn't affect the type of work that you're doing. Now, for me, I don't personally manage any of my own properties. I have a property management company that handles all the day-to-day -day work. But the reason why I like this return is because it's been that sweet spot for me where I can find good value add deals, where I can find properties that are very nice or in a nice area that I can make very nice because I've tried different types of investment properties. I've tried the really low end investment properties, which I wasn't really a big fan of. I want to be able to add more value and have nicer properties where I can still generate a good return. So this was that sweet spot for me. So now, you got to figure out what's right for you and then start zooming out and figure out how much money do you need in order to get enough cash flow for you to be able to fund your lifestyle. And this doesn't mean you have to get all 500000 or a haul of million dollars today, but it gives you a starting point that way now you know this is how much wealth you have to put aside. You have to put it into some sort of cash flow producing assets, whether it's stocks, real estate, or businesses that will now start paying you with cash flow. Now the game is how fast can you accumulate these assets to increase your cash flow that we can have that freedom because now when you have things like inflation happen, well, rents also go up. That way you can continue getting the cash flow that you need. Your dividends also go up. That way you can continue getting the cash flow that you need. Now, of course, there are exceptions to this. Like when you see an economic slowdown, then you can see rents fall, you can see dividends fall. But generally, inflation increases rental prices and it also increases dividends. And this is where now you want to be the asset owner and start working to accumulate these assets. This is where now we can start talking about the next step, which is how do you get to that wealth number faster. And this is where your income becomes so important because if you can have more income going to buy you these assets, you can accumulate that wealth much faster. Your income by itself, I don't care how much money you make, is not going to make you wealthy. But if you use your income smartly, meaning to buy assets instead of just buying nice cars, vacations, and nice homes for yourself to live in, well, now you can use your income to make you wealthier, which means if you have more income, you can build even more wealth faster. That's where now if you want to achieve this type of financial freedom in five years, eight years, 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the more income that you have, the more freedom that you can have. But the only way to get that freedom isn't just by saving that money, it's by buying the assets. And this is where now how can you earn more money? Look, there is a lot of money in the world. The Federal Reserve Bank has printed trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of dollars over the years. Have I said there's a lot of money in the world? If you want to become wealthy, 
Well, now you know the system. You got to buy the assets. And all you need to do is figure out how you can attract a small sliver of all this money that's in the world. And the way that you can attract that money is by providing some sort of value that other people are willing to pay for. Now, this is tough because the first thing is asking for money isn't easy. Getting somebody to want to pay you isn't easy. Trying to find that value isn't easy. Learning how to get rejected isn't easy. Having people make fun of you isn't easy. But if you want to become wealthy, you got to do things that you might not be very comfortable with. And this is where now understanding why are you earning more money? The average person, the majority of people earn money so they can buy nicer things. I want you to earn money that way you can buy more assets. Because now if you're earning money to buy more assets, your assets will pay you with more money. And now when you get paid with more money, go ahead, blow it however you want because that's reoccurring cash flow that you're not having to work to earn. You work to earn money to buy the assets. Then your assets pay you with the cash flow that way you can have more freedom. And this is where now you have to find a way to earn more money. Now you can do this from your job. That means you work harder at your job, you work to get a bonus or a raise. You could do this outside of your job. There are so many different ways for you to earn more money. You can look at becoming a freelancer. Every single business has people that do things for the business. If you can be a freelancer, maybe you can be a graphic designer. Maybe you can make shorts for companies, those short videos that are on Instagram and TikTok. If you can edit those, offer that as a service. If you can edit YouTube videos, offer that as a service. If you can write content, offer that as a service. If you can manage a company's bookkeeping, offer that as a service. If you can manage a CEO's emails, Offer that as a service. There are a lot of platforms on the internet now where you can offer your services, your time in exchange for a fee. You can set the fee. You can work in your own time. Those are another way for you to start earning more money. But the reality is if you want to earn more money, you have to be able to provide more value. And there are so many resources on the internet that you can start looking up. Watch YouTube videos, read books, invest in your own education on how you can start earning more money. And the reason why... This is more important than ever is because right now we're in a time where we have a lot of people, the elder generation that are entering retirement that don't have anywhere near enough money that they will need in order to be able to retire. The United States of America is facing a retirement crisis like no other because we have the biggest generation ever the baby boomers, which are now entering retirement with not enough money. Right now, the median baby boomer has just over $200,000 put aside for retirement. And you might be saying, but Jaspreet, that's the median. What about the average? Maybe they have a higher amount of money put aside in the average figures. Well, if you look at the average amount of money that the average baby boomer has put aside for retirement, the average baby boomer has $162,000 put aside for retirement, according to Fortune magazine. Now, now, when you compare the median and the average retirement accounts numbers with how much money a baby boomer will need to be able to retire comfortably, you can start to see the discrepancy because on the base level, in order to live a basic, comfortable lifestyle, not a lavish lifestyle, but a very basic, comfortable lifestyle, a baby boomer will need $750,000 to be able to fund and live their lifestyle. And if the average and the median baby boomer is making somewhere between one hundred and sixty or to two hundred thousand dollars put aside for their investments, they are very far away from being able to live their lives. What does this mean? Well, we're going to see more aid that will have to come from the government because that's what the government does. And then we'll also have to see more aid from their kids in order to be able to fund their lifestyle. Or we might have to see baby boomers cut back on their expenses. Or we might have to see more baby boomers work later into their retirement years. That way they can continue to fund their lifestyles. But one of the biggest differences between baby boomers and younger people, let's say people under the age of 45, is going to be Social Security. Because Social Security, especially for people under the age of 45, is not going to provide the same cushion that it did for elder people. See, for baby boomers and above, Social Security was a very comfortable nest egg that you knew that you would receive that would be able to fund your lifestyle. But for younger people now, the average younger person understands that, okay, yeah, Social Security isn't going to be able to fund me the way that I thought. And while on one hand, there are talks of Social Security drying up, on the other hand, you have a lot of people saying, oh, no, you don't got to worry about Social Security drying up because the government can just print more money and just fund bigger Social Security checks. The only problem with that, if the government prints 
bigger social security checks is there's going to be a cost to doing so. Because see, the government only has one stream of income. Their income comes from people like you and me, taxpayers some tax dollars. You and I go to work, you get paid, your investments generate a profit, your business makes money, and then you pay a piece of that in taxes. And so when the government spends money they don't have, the person who pays the price then is everybody through inflation. This is a form of taxation without representation because if the government wanted to pass, let's just say, a trillion-dollar infrastructure package, it would have to go through Congress and get approved and get voted upon. And if they can get the votes, then they would have to enact some sort of tax where somebody would have to pay an additional tax in order to raise that trillion dollars to fund this new infrastructure package. But if there's no tax included and it's just a spending bill, that means the government can pass the spending bill and then go to the Federal Reserve Bank and raise this trillion dollars. And if the government can just raise this trillion dollars without putting a tax on you or to whoever they want, because they could, if they wanted to build this one trillion dollar infrastructure package, they could do a tax on rich people. When rich people get taxed, you will know exactly where that money is going. If the rich people get taxed and that money is used to fund the infrastructure package, you know where the money is coming from. But when the money comes from the Federal Reserve Bank, who pays for it? Now, it's not the person who would have paid the tax, it's everybody. Because when the Federal Reserve Bank prints money to fund the government spending, then everybody pays for it in the form of inflation. Because inflation is when you increase the amount of dollars out there, which in effect decreases the buying power of each individual dollar, which causes the price of things to go up. So now, if the government wanted to pad up Social Security, they can do so. They can print more money with the help of the Federal Reserve Bank. And if they do so, yeah, they can send you huge Social Security checks. Screw a $2,000 Social Security check. They can send you a $20,000 weekly Social Security check. But there's going to be a cost to that. The price of things will rise. And we're already facing an inflation crisis right now. Which means, yes, the government can send you bigger Social Security checks. Yay! But the price of everything you want to buy with your Social Security checks is growing faster than your Social Security check itself. That's what we've been seeing happen. The government has been increasing Social Security checks at some of the fastest rates we've seen over the last couple of years. But the rate at which the government is increasing the Social Security check size isn't even keeping up with inflation. And now you have to think, if you have people that are relying on their Social Security check in order to be able to survive... But the Social Security checks aren't keeping up with how fast their grocery bills are rising. What is that going to mean? They can continue trying to chase and print more money, but you're never going to be able to live the life that you want if you were relying on the government spending to be able to fund your expenses. And this is where now we are going to face a major retirement crisis because you have this whole baby boomer generation that is now entering retirement Most people don't have enough money or anywhere near enough money to be able to retire, but they're going to need money in order to retire. And we did a full breakdown of this in Market Briefs, which is my free financial newsletter, which is why if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I highly recommend you do so. It's a free newsletter where my team is breaking down what's happening in things like the housing market, the economy, the stock market, crypto, and the global economy into a fun, witty, and easy-to-read email. You can read this email in less than five minutes every morning, and it's completely free. So if you haven't joined Market Briefs yet, I got the link to how you can join Market Briefs down in the description below. And so now we have this whole generation of people that are entering retirement or getting close to retirement that don't have enough money to retire, which is going to cause problems at a time where we're already facing an inflation crisis. And this is where what's going to happen over the next 10 years. How are these people going to be able to fund their retirement? And From what we've seen happen, most likely the government will get involved again. And so now even if they don't raise your Social Security taxes, well, you will continue to fund this Social Security spending because that would increase inflation. See, the problem and the reason why Social Security is drying up faster than expected now is, number one, people are living longer than expected, which is a good thing. People are living longer, but that means the government has to continue paying out the Social Security money for more and more months. Number two is that the rate at which the government is having to increase your Social Security checks, because every year the government increases Social Security payments to 
try to keep up with inflation, although they're not actually keeping up with inflation, but they try to, well, that means that the government has to pay out more and more money faster to keep up with Social Security. And then three, they're not generating enough money from the Social Security taxes. Now, of course, they could raise Social Security taxes, but that means more of your income today is going to be going into the government's pockets to fund Social Security. But again, this goes back to now, if you want to be financially free, if you want to be able to retire, the best way to do that is not by relying on a pension because most of us will never ever see a pension in our lives. It's not by relying on Social Security because no matter what, Social Security is not going to be able to outpace inflation. It's going to be by relying on yourself. And this means now you have to get financially educated yourself and go out and actually buy assets. That way you can create your own cash flow or that way you can accumulate enough assets. That way you can live your life without having to worry about money and without having to stress about what the government's doing because the reality is inflation has been around for a long time inflation ever since the 2020 pandemic has become a much bigger concern and it's on people's minds because before 2020 inflation was two to three percent which is just small enough for the average person not to worry or care about it but then when you saw inflation go up to five six seven eight nine percent after the 2020 pandemic that was when people really started to get worried about inflation and even if inflation continues to fall if inflation is rising faster than people's wages that means that the average person is becoming poorer and the social security fund continues to dry up even faster and this is where now understanding okay we have this inflation or re retirement crisis happening and it becomes even more important for you as a financially savvy investor to now go out and start accumulating those assets. And the reality is we're never taught this stuff in school. And you might wonder, well, why are we never taught this? Well, our school system is not designed to breed financially wealthy people. Our school system is not designed to breed entrepreneurs. Our school system is not designed to teach you how to invest. Our school system is designed to do one thing, is to teach you how to become an employee. Now, there's not a bad thing to be an employee. It's not something wrong to be an employee. We need good, smart, hardworking, dedicated, innovative employees, even entrepreneurs. Not everybody can be an entrepreneur. However, everybody can be financially educated and everybody can be financially smart. But unfortunately, our education system lacks in that financial education because the average person graduate school with not a single bit of knowledge of how to invest their money. You go and get a job and you might be skilled at how to get a job, but then you go get this job and you have no idea what to do with this money. Maybe your employer gives you a pamphlet about what their 401k is and everybody around you starts talking about how much they love their 401k. So then you do the same thing. You open up a 401k if you're lucky because most people actually don't even have a 401k. They have no investments at all. But if you go out and do what everybody else does and you start opening your 401k, that might be the extent of what you do. But this is where that financial education becomes so important, where it's something that we're never taught. And now you have to go out of your way to learn how to do this. And unfortunately, in this system that we have, the people that build the most wealth are not the people that have the best jobs or who that work the hardest at their jobs or who work to climb the corporate ladder the most. It's the people who accumulate the most assets. And this doesn't mean that you have to be born with a silver spoon in your mouth. It doesn't mean that you have to be born with a million dollars. It doesn't mean that you have to be born with rich parents. It means you have to understand this. It means you have to understand that the more assets that you buy, the wealthier you will become. And that means that you want to use more of your income today to buy more assets, whether it's stocks, whether it's real estate, whether it's investing in businesses. The more assets that you can accumulate, the more cash flow that you can generate. The more assets that you can buy, the more wealth that you can build. But it starts with you starting. And you can start with as little as $100, but you have to get started because the reality is in this economic system, the people who become wealthy are not the people who have the best jobs. It's not the people who have the best degrees. It's not the people who have the best titles. It's not the people who are the richest parents. It's the people that accumulate the most assets. And this is one of those things where if you do not understand this, you are going to be at the mercy of people who have money because then you're going to constantly be working to pay off your rent. You're going to constantly be working to pay your car off. You're going to constantly be working to pay off the vacation that you took six months ago. 
And this is where now you have to take a step back and understand that this is the way that the system is. And if you don't learn this because school doesn't teach you this, and most of our parents don't teach us this because I never learned this in school. My parents never told me a thing about investing or real estate investing because they didn't know it either. But now, thanks to YouTube, this information has become so much more accessible. And this is where now you have to go out and do something about it because we're seeing what's going on with baby boomers. Baby boomers are going to face a very tough time in retirement. And we're going to see more and more young people now have to turn around and start supporting their baby boomer parents or grandparents, which is going to be very interesting, especially with whatever's going to happen with student loans, because student loans still are, at the time of me recording this video, paused. And if student loans get reenacted, you bet that there's going to be a whole wave of young people that all of a sudden have been living paycheck to paycheck, have this brand new bill, which they completely forgot about because over the last number of years, nobody has paid a student loan payment. And now if a whole wave of young people get hit, but now a new student loan payment that they forgot about, and then a little bit after that, they also have to send some money back home to mom and dad because they need money to be able to fund their retirement. That way they can go on vacation and do nice things. You can bet that that's going to put more stress on the younger generation, which is why now you need to understand that you want to be able to be in a situation where you can take care of yourself, take care of other people. And the way that you do that isn't by just working harder at your job. It's by accumulating the assets. And now you have to understand where your job comes into play. Your job is what produces you an income. It's what produces you an earned income. You have to go to work to earn this money. Your assets are what produce a passive income. So now you want to go to work to get this earned income. That way you can get more passive income because there's a limit to how much you can earn, but there's no limit to how much you can passively get. So you need to go out and earn that money. That way you can go and buy more of these investments that will pay you with the cash flow. But that means now, how can you earn more money? Now, of course, you can do it from a job. You can work to start your own side hustle. You can start your own business. You can be a freelancer. There's so many things that you can do, but you have to start earning your money the right way, which means you might have to sacrifice some of the nice things right now. That means you might have to sacrifice some of the parties. You might have to sacrifice the car. You might have to sacrifice some of the vacations. You might have to sacrifice how much you're eating out. You have to sacrifice some of the spending that we have our money to buy assets. And that doesn't mean you want to just cut back. I recommend you cut back and earn more. But this is where now, why are you earning money? The average person earns money to buy things, but wealthy people and people who aspire to become wealthy earn money to buy assets. And this is where now, once you understand this, the next thing is you want to make sure you're also not falling into the big financial traps out there that are going to pull you back as you're trying to build your wealth. Building wealth isn't rocket science, but there are some little traps out there that if you don't catch them early on, they can make becoming wealthy extremely difficult. Now, some of these traps are very obvious. Like going to Gucci and financing a brand new Gucci belt is a pretty obvious financial trap where now you're buying something that's losing money and then not on top of that, you're also paying interest to buy this thing that's losing you money. But there are a whole bunch of other traps that aren't so obvious that can really eat away at your chance of becoming financially wealthy. So let me go over 10 of the biggest financial traps that you need to avoid with number one being avoid taking financial advice from broke people because the reality is everybody has an opinion of what you should be doing with your money, how you should be investing your money, how you should be saving your money, what you should be buying with your money, and where you need to be keeping your money. And if somebody has never done anything with their own money, and they're telling you what you need to be doing with your money, you want to be very, very, very cautious with that. And this is where it can become a little bit difficult, because the average person is broke. And the average person is doing very similar things. And now if you want to do something different and you start listening to what let's just say wealthy people do that might require you to do something that everybody else thinks is weird and this is where sometimes the popular opinion isn't the right thing to do that's why i call what i do the minority mindset because it's all about thinking differently than the majority of people because the reality is if you keep doing what the majority of people do you're going to end up like the majority of people which financially is broke. And I don't say this to be funny or to just say this in general terms. I mean, statistically, the average person, the majority of people have no money put aside for savings. The majority of people are living paycheck to paycheck. And so if you keep doing what everybody else does, and if you keep listening to the advice that everybody's giving you, if you keep doing that, you're going to end up just like everybody else. And this is where you might have to do things a little bit differently. And you want to be very cautious with who you're getting advice from. I mean, one of the things that I say is never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. I don't recommend you do anything because your goals are different than mine. 
your risk tolerance is different than mine. Your time horizon is different than mine. Your investment education is different than mine. And what you're looking to do with your money is different than mine. And this is where you have to learn from different people, different opinions, and then find the best option for you. And you want to be very cautious when you're listening to somebody who has never earned any real amounts of wealth. And this is where also, if you're working with a financial advisor, I also want you to be cautious because some financial advisors can be very good. Some financial advisors can be not so good. Because some financial advisors are just people making $75,000 a year by telling you what you need to be doing with your money when they've never actually achieved that wealth themselves. And so now, if you have a financial advisor, the thing that I always say is, good, nothing wrong with that. But you need to have enough financial education to know if your financial advisor is doing a good job or not. And you also need to look at how your financial advisor is being compensated because if they're getting paid no matter what, whether you're losing money or making money, what is their incentive to make you any money? So you have to be very careful with the fees that your financial advisor is charging you, and you have to be especially careful with what type of advice you're listing from your financial advisor. This brings me to number two, which is you don't want to be the person that's just stimulating the economy to make the economy function. Because in this economic system, the way that our economy works is the more money you spend, the more money somebody else makes. The more money you spend as sweet greens, which... I just tried sweet greens not too long very recently, and I've become a very big fan of sweet greens almost overnight. The more money you spend at sweet greens, the more money sweet greens makes. In order for the economy to grow, people have to spend more money. And we live in a consumer society here in America. Now, that's a good thing if you are an investor and a business owner because people love spending money. But it's not so good if you are a consumer because that means now, if you do what everybody else does, that means you're spending all your money and some with the help of credit card debt or home equity lines of credit or other loans because people love spending money, which means you have nothing left to build your own wealth. And this is where I want you to understand that if you want to build wealth, you can't keep making everybody else rich. And the system is designed to get you to spend money. The best example that I can give you of this is just think of the stimulus checks. When the government sent out thousands of dollars with the stimulus checks to people, what were those checks intended to do? Were they intended to A, make you wealthy, or B, make other people wealthy? If you think they were intended to make you wealthy, we got to go back to understand what does a stimulus check do? It's there to stimulate the economy, meaning give the average American money because the government knows that the average American is going to go out and spend this money. And when the average American goes out and spends money that they got freshly in their pocket, that means Kroger makes more money. That means Amazon makes more money. That means Apple makes more money. That means Lululemon makes more money. That means Chipotle makes more money. That means Sweet Greens makes more money. And this is where now you have to understand that if the system is designed for people to spend money because it encourages people to spend money, everybody in the world wants you to spend your money. The government wants you to spend your money because that means it's going to grow the economy. And if the economy is growing, well, it's good for whoever's in power in government because then they can go out and talk about how strong the economy is and how they were able to stimulate the economy. So the government wants you to spend money. Wall Street wants you to spend your money because if you're spending your money, well, then Wall Street can show that their companies that they're invested in have higher profits and they're making more money and the investors will see their investments soar. Corporations want you to spend your money because if you're spending money, that means Walmart's making more money. And if Walmart's making more money, well, that's good for Walmart and that's why they want you to spend more money. The only person that doesn't want you to spend money is you because even your banker wants you to spend money because your banker wants you to spend so much money that you have to go into debt to continue spending money because your banker gets paid when you borrow money. And if you don't spend all that money, well, then your banker's not going to be getting paid. That's why now, if you are the only person that doesn't want you to spend your money, you have to now build that financial education to understand when it's okay to spend. Look, there's not a problem with you having nice things. I want you to have all the nice things. I just want you to be able to afford it first. That's the key. Because the system is designed to get you to spend money. But if you spend all of your money today, you're never going to have any money to build your wealth tomorrow. And what I'm saying is let's flip this up a little bit. Where now you spend your money to make yourself rich first, then you go out and make everybody else rich. And that's where now, hey, when you got the money, when you got the assets, go out and buy whatever the heck you want. If you want the Gucci, great. You can afford it. Your assets will pay for it. You want the BMW, great. Your assets can pay for it. You want a Rolls Royce, fine. Make sure you can afford it. 
There's nothing wrong with you wanting nice things. I mean, that's why you work to get money in the first place. That way you can have all the luxury, all the exotics, and live that life that most people dream of. I want you to be able to get that. But if you want to be able to actually afford it, that we don't have to worry about money, and so you don't have to work until you die, that means now you have to actually flip the script and make yourself rich first. And if you're spending all of your money, you're never going to have a chance to make yourself rich first because you're so focused on making sure Amazon is rich. You're so focused on making sure Lululemon is rich. You're so focused on making sure that everybody else gets paid before you do. And if you want to build your own wealth first, you have to make sure that you build wealth first before you make everybody else rich. The third thing, the third trap that you want to avoid is investing emotionally. Now, the reason why this is so important is because, well, for one, investing has become so much more accessible to people, which is good. Number two, financial news and education has become so much more accessible to people, which is good. Number three, people also trade on emotion. And sometimes they don't know how to decipher the emotion from investment, education, which is not so good. And so what we've been seeing happen is over the last few years, especially because over the last few years after the pandemic, we've seen a huge boom in retail investors, meaning regular people who have opened up their first investment account, their first investment brokerage, and have started making their own investments themselves, which is great. But without any sort of financial education, that also opens up a whole new world of hurt because people want to find the next hot thing. And now with the news and the media so accessible, people want to do what everybody else is doing because that's the natural human nature. And so when you hear of the next meme stock start to pop off and you hear the news, you see CNBC talking about it, you see people on YouTube talking about it, you see people on Reddit talking about it, now you get excited because you see that the stock has jumped 300% and then you jump in and buy. Well, by the time it hits the news, you're probably too late. And then when things start to turn around and whether it's a meme stock or anything else, that's when people start to panic. They start to sell. They start to get scared. They don't want to lose money. And so they sell. And so now instead of buying low, selling high, you're buying high and selling low. And this is why the average person ends up losing money in the stock market when in reality, the stock market has grown over the last 100 years. This doesn't mean that the stock market has only gone up. There's been many periods, many years where the stock market has gone down. But the people who have held long enough to good investments were able to make money again and again and again because you hold through these cycles. And you can never do that if you're investing emotionally and unfortunately the easy access to stock brokerages and the easy access to all the information on the internet is a double-edged sword, where if you use it the right way and you learn to get educated and you learn how to invest your money smartly, you can build way more wealth. But if you fall into the emotional side and you just want to get into the get-rich-quick schemes and you want to find the quickest way to make a lot of money, I mean, who wants to get rich slowly? When you do that, well, you also risk losing all of your money and more because now you're following your emotions instead of following your finances. And also because a lot of stock brokerages make it very easy to trade on margin. Margin is debt. And so now instead of investing the $1,000 that you have and thinking, man, if I could double this $1,000, that would be great. You can invest $5,000 because now your stock brokerage is going to give you all that extra debt. And now you could double your $5,000 make a whole lot more money, but now you can lose all that money and some, which is why if you're going to be investing your money, you want to understand that number one, long-term investing is where the real wealth is built. Number two, never invest more than you're willing to lose. Number three, understand that investing has risks. You're never guaranteed to make money when you invest. In fact, you will probably lose money at some point, which is why you want to never blindly trust a random guy on YouTube. And four, understand that patience is a huge key to building true long-term wealth instead of being the person that's always trying to chase the next hot stock. Now, I have a free ebook on how to start investing your money, which goes over how you can start generating cash flow from investments. This ebook is through Market Insiders. If you want to read this ebook on how you can start investing and how you can start generating cash flow, it's completely free. If you want to read the ebook, I've got the link to how you can download it down in the description below. The fourth trap that you want to avoid is avoiding 0% APR because... The reality is there's a cost to borrowing money because when you go and borrow money to buy a home, the bank is going to charge you interest. When you go and borrow money on your credit card, your bank is going to charge you interest. Now, when a company charges you $1,000 to buy, say, a phone, but they're willing to 
sell you this phone at $100 a month with 0% APR. Something has to be fishy there because there's a cost to borrow money. I mean, $1,000 today is worth more than $1,000 a year from now. So if a company is letting you take their product and pay it off in installments, something has to be going on here. Well, there is. And there's the reason why 0% APR is so profitable to companies and is so profitable to banks because they know that if they can offer you the 0% APR, number one, they're going to be able to sell way more stuff because more and more people are going to buy this item at 0% APR who can't afford it otherwise. So now you stretch your finances even thinner. And then number two, they also know that when you go into the 0% APR, you're also going to go and buy way more things than you would if you bought the item outright. If you had to buy a $1,000 iPhone outright, you might not buy all the AirPods and all the other accessories with it. But when you're buying it with 0% APR, they know that you're much more likely to buy way more things because you don't have that same pain of spending the $1,000 today. And then third, because so many people end up overspending with over 0% APR, you many people will end up happening is that at the end of the 0% APR term, you're not able to pay it off fast enough, which means now you get slapped with a super high interest rate, which means now not only are they selling you more stuff, they're also still getting the interest. So it's a double whammy where now you're getting hit on spending more money, but then you also pay the interest if you don't pay it off in time. This brings me to money trap number five, which is you do not plan for a life event. The majority of Americans today don't have a thousand dollars put aside to protect them against an emergency. Now, the reality is life happens and emergencies happen. This is a part of life. Things will go wrong. Accidents will happen. Kids break their arms. Cars get damaged. Maintenance needs to be done. Windows break. And so now if you don't plan for this, you're going to be the one that pays the price. Now, on one hand, that means having a savings cushion. That way, when things go wrong, you don't have to go into debt to cover that savings cushion. But that also means planning for economic slowdowns. We have seen economic slowdowns happen in the United States pretty much every decade or so. In fact, after the 2008 crash was when we saw the longest period in our modern American history, like over the last century or so, without a recession, meaning from the Great Depression until now, the longest period that our United States economy has gone without a recession was between 2008 and 2020. And so now when we know recessions are a part of our economic system, market crashes happen. When you see a recession, asset prices go down. When we see this happen, why are people always so surprised when a recession hits? Because people never want to assume something bad will happen. When things go wrong and things are bad, people assume that nothing good will ever happen again. And likewise, when things are booming, things are good, the economy is growing, nobody thinks that anything bad could ever happen. And then when nobody thinks anything bad could ever happen, they don't prepare or plan for anything bad happening. So that way, when something bad does happen, because it's inevitable, bad things happen. Nothing can go up forever, just like nothing can go down forever, unless it goes to bankrupt. But nothing can go up forever. And so if you plan for everything to just go up in perpetuity, what's going to happen? You're setting yourself up for disaster and failure, which is why you want to be prepared. And this is where you prepare your finances by having some savings cushion put aside, but also being ready to capitalize on investment opportunities and understanding that nothing can go straight up forever. That way you are not shocked and blindsided when bad things happen in the economy because you've looked at history and you see, oh my God, we had a recession in 2020. Oh my God, we had a recession in 2008. Oh my God, we had a recession in 2000 and 2001. This could happen again. So how do I prepare that way? Now I'm not blindsided, but I can also capitalize on what's happening around me. And this is where you prepare for anything to go wrong. The saying is hope for the best, but plan for the worst. But what ends up happening for the majority of people is they hope for the best and plan for nothing. The sixth trap that you want to avoid is saving all of your money. Now, saving money is better than spending all of your money. But the unfortunate reality with saving your money, especially in this economic system, is that when you save your money, your savings get eaten away by inflation. Inflation has been around for a long time. It's been around since before the pandemic, and it only became a big deal after the pandemic because of how fast inflation started to accelerate. But before the pandemic, your savings were still being eaten away by inflation, although maybe it was only 1% or 2% that your savings were being 
decreased by, but now with high inflation, it has become so much more important for you to become financially educated, which is where you don't want to save all of your money. If the inflation rate is higher than the interest rate you're getting from your savings, that means your savings are slowly losing value. And now there's a lot of things that you can do with these savings. Obviously, you want to have some cash put aside to protect you against an emergency, and you want to have cash put aside to take advantage of investment opportunities. But then you also want to be investing your money. Now, you can invest this money into your own financial education. You can invest this money into your own business idea. You can invest this money into other people's business idea startups. You can invest this money into stocks. You can invest this money into real estate. You're going to look into investing some of this money into physical gold. There are an infinite number of ways that you can invest this money. But the key is when you keep that savings all in cash, well, those savings are being eaten away. And the value of those savings are slowly dropping. So you're working hard to save money. But then as the Fed prints money, the hard work that you're working to save is slowly being eaten away. Like savings or money, rather is not a very good store of value. If you go to work and you earn $100,000, the 40 or 50 or 60 or 100 hours a week that you put in to earn that $100,000 is symbolized through the $100,000 in cash that you saved. Now, if you saved every one of those dollars that you earned, if you saved all $100,000 and you put it in the bank, well, that $100,000 is a symbol or depiction or value of how much work and effort you provided. Well, 10 years from now, that $100,000 that you have in the bank is not going to be able to buy what $100,000 can today. That doesn't mean that the work or value that you provided has diminished. It means that the store of value which you used to depict how much effort you put in in your job has lost value. And so that currency, that cash is losing value, which is why you want to convert that dead cash into something that also produces value, whether it be in businesses or real estate or something else, where now you're putting the cash to work. But of course, you got to be smart with this. You don't want to just throw your money into investments when it's not a good investment or when it's not a good time to invest. But you have to be educated enough to understand that saving your money is not how you become wealthy. Although most of us were taught that, that's not the reality. If you want to become wealthy, you cannot save your way to wealth. You have to invest your way to wealth. You have to own the assets and saving your money has to be done strategically. The seventh trap that you want to avoid is avoid high risk schemes. We all know some people or multiple people that are looking for the next hot thing to get rich quick. Now, nobody wants to call it a get rich scheme because that would be way too obvious. Instead, you look for the next hot thing, the next hot investment, the next hot cryptocurrency, the next hot meme stock. That way you can throw your money in there and hopefully make a lot of money. And maybe you can find it early enough that way you can make that money early on. But the reality is now, the higher the risk you take, the higher chance you have to lose all of your money. Sure, you can see huge returns, but you can also lose all that money just as fast. And this is where now you have to understand that there's a cost to taking all these get-rich-quick investments or schemes or whatever you want to call it because if you keep losing your money in these things, that's money that isn't being compounded or invested into something that can actually grow sustainably and build you real wealth. And so now if something seems too good to be true, it probably is. But also understand that if you want to build real sustainable wealth, you have to put your money into assets. For me, the bulk of my investments are into sustainable investments that have proven the test of time. That's about 80% of my investments. The other 20% are more of what I call speculative investments. Some of these are startup investments. Startup investments have the ability to make a lot of money, but Statistics show us that the average startup investment will fail. Somewhere between eight to nine startup investments will go bust or bankrupt in the first five years. So most startups that I invest in will probably fail. I understand that. I also invest in cryptocurrency. Now, cryptocurrency is very volatile. It can go up very quickly and it can go down just as quickly. Now, I believe in the value of the blockchain and the future of cryptocurrency, which is why I buy it. But I also understand how volatile it is. And I understand that it can go to zero. If it goes to zero, is it going to affect me? No, not really, because it's a small piece of my investment portfolio. Although I do believe in it, it's still not a huge chunk of my investment portfolio. I also own some physical gold. This is about 2% of my total investment portfolio, because this is an alternative way for me to save hard money. 
but I also don't dump all of my money into gold because it doesn't really produce any value. It just sits there and looks back at me. And so now if you're going to be investing your money into, say, the more fun, more speculative types of investments, fine. But just make sure you understand where it fits in your investment portfolio. It's okay to have some fun with some of your money in your investments, but you have to know where it fits within your investment portfolio. For me, it's now maybe about 20% of my investment portfolio total, which includes my cryptocurrency, my startup investments, and my physical gold. Before, it was only around 10%. Then recently, I expanded it to closer to 20% because I have been able to build more wealth so I can afford to have more money in my speculative investments. But this is where you have to find what's the right number for you and understand that sure, these speculative investments could grow very fast, but they probably won't. And if they don't, are you going to be okay? So you have to make sure you look at your investment portfolio in a holistic manner and understand how you're going to actually build your wealth. The eighth trap that you have to avoid is not investing in your own financial education. And there's a number of different ways that you can do this because the number one way that you're going to learn, especially in your financial education, is by making mistakes. That means you go out and do something. You go out and you start investing in stocks, you lose money, and then you figure out why you lose money. You start reading more books, you do things to learn how to invest your money better, and that happens by doing by experience through mistakes. This experience education cannot be learned anywhere else. You have to go out and do that. But in addition to that, you also want to be in spending and investing your money and time into learning as well. That means watching YouTube videos. That is a free way for you to start learning and building that financial education. Then I want you to read books. And then I want you to also take some classes, which cost money. Now, taking classes is probably one of the most uh let's call it argued way of learning and building your financial education. And I know this from firsthand experience because when I was finishing college, I spent about 3000 I think it was $3,500 on a real estate class to learn how to wholesale real estate. And I remember when I talked to people about it because they didn't have tons of money back then. That was a huge sum of money for then. I remember talking to people and people thought that I lost my mind, that I was investing in buying the scam and why would I want to pay thousands of dollars to learn how to do this thing. But that $3,000 or $3,500 that I spent on that made me no money in the first month. But then it did make me no money the second month. And then it made me no money the third month. And then it made me no money the fourth month. But then the fifth month, that was when I started making money from the education that I learned. And that was when I started to really apply what I learned. And this is where now understanding that if you want to invest in your financial education by taking some of these classes, number one, understand who is teaching it. Number two, is it reputable? Are you learning something with a actual goal? Or are you learning this how to make six figures in 60 days? Because if it's six figures in 60 days without any actual information on what you're learning, it's probably a scam. But now understanding Who's teaching it? What are you learning? And are you ready for it? Because if you don't have the money for that financial education class, then go out and use the free content on the internet. Start investing money when you have money. Because if you just start going into debt and you don't apply the information, well, now you're going to be paying off that bad investment for a long time. And then you also have to ask yourself, are you going to be able to apply and do whatever it takes to utilize that information? Because most people won't. But if you're one of those people that will apply it, then this can be a good investment for you. Because the reality is with most online education, I think it's like 90% of people will never use the information that they learn. And so if you're one of those 90% of people that are not going to use that information, don't buy it. Save yourself the money and go put that money into the S&P 500 or to the stock market index fund or whatever it is. That way now you can just own something. But if you're actually going to use the information and you know that you will use it and you know that you'll apply it and you're learning from somebody good and it's something that you can actually use, then it can be a worthwhile investment. The ninth trap that you have to avoid is you spend money based off of what you feel that you deserve, not what you can afford. We live in this Instagram flex culture where everybody on the internet has a Gucci bag, everybody drives a Mercedes, everybody has a BMW parked in their parking lot, and everybody travels to the Bahamas and everybody's going to Cancun for some reason. Now, how do they afford it? I have no idea, but this is what's happening. And now when you are in this Instagram culture where everybody has all these nice things, you want to have it too because it seems normal. Everybody has a nice purses. Everybody has a nice clothes. Everybody's going out to these fancy restaurants. So you want to be able to post that as well. And this is where you have to understand that if you spend money based off of what you deserve instead of what you earn, 
you are going to be spending the rest of your life paying off all those expensive pictures and videos and boomerangs on Instagram, which apparently I was told recently the boomerangs are only for old people. I don't know if that's true or not, but that's what somebody was telling me. This is where you have to understand that you got to live within your means. And that means you got to live and act your wage. I think that's what Dave Ramsey says, act your wage. Because if you keep trying to do what everybody else on Instagram is doing, well, they're not the ones paying your bills. You are. And you have to be smart with your spending and live within your means. And that means right now, maybe you don't go on that nice vacation. Maybe you're not going out to the fancy restaurants. Maybe you have to be a little bit more creative. You have to be a little bit more crafty. And if you're willing to make that sacrifice, well, I bet you that 10 years from now, you're going to be able to go out and do all that fancy stuff when all of your friends who were broke trying to show it off are going to be struggling to make back their previous payments while you can go out and do it and afford it and then all your friends who are snapchatting and instagram and all that cool stuff before are going to come to you asking how can you afford all these nice things now and this is where you have to kind of get away from the temptation of wanting to show it off right now and want to build that wealth because the unfortunate reality is you cannot show off your stock market portfolio the same way you can your gucci belt this is why it's so hard for regular people because everybody is showing off all their nice things before they used to only show it off when you saw them in person where you'd see that they had the gucci belt on or whatever the red shoes are the red bottom shoes or whatever they're called now it's all over social media and if you're constantly on Instagram, on Snapchat, on Facebook, or whatever other TikTok there is out there, and you keep seeing people post it, you're going to want it too. And when you want it before you can afford it, you're going to spend money that you don't have buying things that you shouldn't be buying when you should be buying assets right now. And the 10th trap that you have to avoid is getting comfortable. Comfort is the biggest disease that prevents people from ever achieving any true financial success or true financial freedom because when you get comfortable, well, you don't want to leave that comfort. And you get caught into the, I have nice health care for my work. I have a nice 401k for my work. I have this nice salary, which, yeah, maybe I don't have the most financial freedom, but I'm comfortable. I can pay my bills and I can get by. And sacrificing that comfort can be very risky because now you go from having all this cushy support and pillow and nest egg to now having nothing. But unless you're willing to take a risk, you're never going to be able to see the huge success that you dream about. And this is where you have to just ask yourself, what is it that you want? Do you want to live big and really have that nice dream stuff that most people dream about? Or do you just want to be comfortable? And if you're not willing to make that sacrifice, you are never going to be able to have that life that most people dream of. And that's okay for most people. But if that's not what you want, you cannot get comfortable in your current situation in your life. You can't get comfortable with your health care, your 401k, or your salary. You can't get comfortable with being comfortable. You can't get comfortable with having the nice things, and you can't get comfortable feeling bad for yourself and just kind of going into this whole idea of thinking that, well, this is okay, that this is what I deserve, that this is where I'm supposed to be. No. If you want to have something better, you can't get comfortable where you are, and then you have to go out and do something completely different. And then figure out how you can excel, how you can scale, and how you can achieve that life that you want. And that means that you're going to have to do something that's different and uncomfortable. And that's hard because then people will laugh at you. People are going to see that you downgraded your car. And they're not going to understand why you went from a BMW to a Toyota. And they might make fun of you. And then they're going to wonder why you're not going on vacation with them anymore. They're going to ask you a lot of questions about why you're not partying with them anymore. They might think that you lost your mind. But this is where now, if you really want to build that wealth... If you really want to have that financial freedom, you're going to have to do things that the majority of people are not willing to do. The majority of Americans cannot afford to buy a home. That's according to data that came out in 2023, which says that about 6 out of 10 Americans cannot afford to buy a home in this economic environment. Now, that being said, we're not seeing homes in the housing market becoming more affordable. In fact, every time we see a little dip 